Okay, great. Okay, so this is us. Like I said, I'm the program manager and Jill is our academic program specialist. I have my MLIS from our own program and Jill has hers from Syracuse. And these are some of our faculty um, that you would be working with as a student. Um, I like to show this because there are a lot of adjunct faculty members on the bottom row. So we have a lot of full-time faculty members who are who are amazing and, and phenomenal, but we also have adjunct faculty members who have lots of great experience. So Rachel Gammons and Susie Wilson on the bottom row are work at U University of Maryland libraries um, in the libraries and they have they teach a class on academic libraries. Beatrice Hasbo is the preservationist of, at the Library of Congress and she teaches our preservation class. Um, Steven Greenberg teaches our history of the book class and he's been a rare books librarian for like over 25 years. Um, Abby Bazil is also an academic librarian and Ryan O'Grady was a lecturer and now he's a full-time faculty. But these are just some of our, our faculty and if you go to the directory and you're curious about faculty members, you can see more about their research. Um, and each of them, usually they have websites if you want to learn more about them. And our adjunct faculty do as well. Okay, so we have about 300 current students. 30%, um, this is not correct right now because we are all basically online right now. 30% are online only, 10% are in-person only, and 60% of our students say that they take a hybrid approach of courses. They take some online, some in person. Um, that changes depending on their circumstances. Some people come to the program um, in person and then they switch to online if they get a job or some people start online, get a TA or GA ship on campus and then end up taking classes um, more on campus or more online, depending on their schedule. Um, so curriculum wise, we have four required core courses, one field study experience or a thesis. Um, it's either or most of our students choose to do a field study, but there are more and more people doing a thesis these days. Um, but it's still only a handful of people every year. And then there are seven elective courses. If you do decide to go the thesis route, you do have to take a couple extra courses like a research methods course um, and I think a seminar. But you, so you'll have like two less electives, but that is only if you do the thesis, thesis part. So for the field study, um, the general field study, if you're just doing the MLIS program not in school libraries, is LBSC 707. And these are some of the places that people did their field study last spring. A lot of them are local organizations, um, but for people who are online only and live elsewhere in the, com in the country, you can do a field study anywhere. So this semester, somebody did theirs in New Jersey at their local library, just anywhere you can you can do a field study is fine. And then if you are in the school library program, you do the internship in school libraries, which is, is two placements, one at either an elementary or middle school, and then wait, no, one at an elementary school. I think one at elementary or middle, and then one at a high school. So you do two placements, one in lower K through 12 and one in a high school. And that can also be done anywhere in the country. We had somebody last year who is teaching English abroad in China and she did her her field study at a, an international school in China. Okay, and then we have, these are our specializations. You'll also see the individualized program plan, which just it basically means you use your seven electives to take whatever courses you want. Um, you can take courses from any specialization, whatever you want to do. Um, so the specializations are not rigid plans of study. You don't have to take all of your electives in one specialization. They're more of a way for us to show you where our courses fall, so archives and digital curation, um, what courses we have in that area, school, legal informatics, diversity and inclusion. The only one, the only caveat is school libraries. You do need to take the seven specific electives because the school library program leads to a certification as a school librarian in Maryland. So you do get an extra certification on your transcript that shows that you're certified to be a school librarian in Maryland. 
And then any state that has a reciprocity agreement with us, which I think is like 45 to 48 states, it's most of the other states. So we have specialization guides that help students choose courses within each of these specializations. And we also have career guides to help, um, help people choose courses based on careers, right? Some people have specific careers in mind. So right now we have them on archives, public librarianship, academic librarianship, K through 12, librarianship, law, museum and cultural institutions, youth services and PhD candidacy. And those are only their advising materials for our current students, but if you are, if you have questions about them, um, I can let you know a little bit more, but basically they give you an overview of the field, sample job titles, professional organizations that you should be involved in, um, and then the competencies for each career mapped to our courses. So like for academic librarianship, you should probably take some sort of teaching or instruction course. Um, you should probably take some kind of information literacy course, that sort of thing, and then we map it to our courses. Oh, so we also have the Hills dual degree. If you're interested in Hills, you get both the MLIS and the master's um, in history. You have to complete 54 credits. So the MLIS alone is 36 credits and usually an MA in history is 36 credits. But if you do them both in the Hills program, it only takes 54 credits. And most people do it in three years. Most people do the MLIS in two years but for either Hills or MLIS, you have up to five years to complete it. We also have the school library program. If you do the school library specialization, you get the certification to be a school librarian in the state of Maryland. Um, it's also valid in any other state with a reciprocity agreement. And then the museum, it's called Museum Scholarship and Material Culture Certificate. Um, it's a certificate program that you can do with your electives in the MLIS program. It only takes four courses. Um, one of them is like an intro to museums work. Um, one of them, I don't remember what the second one is, but the third one is a practicum, which can take the place of your field study. So if you do the museum study certificate, you don't need to do also do the MLIS field study. The practicum can count for both. And then the fourth course is just an elective. So any one of your MLIS courses can count for that elective. But these are just sort of things that you can do in addition to the MLIS. Um, these are just some of the places our graduates, recent graduates are working. And a lot of these, these students end up getting jobs from their field study. Usually the place they do their field study ends up hiring them for positions. It's sort of like a trial, a trial run. Um, one of our students who just did her field study at a local library in New Jersey where she lives, she did a remote field study and they're hiring her to continue on at the library. A lot of people end up in academic libraries, um, archives. I think I have stats a little, a little further on. For student organizations, we have an ALA student chapter and SLA, Special Library Associ Association chapter. Those are not active right now, but the students are, students are welcome to start them up again if they'd like. Um, I just think the reason they're not active is because we have such active, robust local organizations. So the DC and Maryland chapters of SLA are really active and students who get involved in that I think they find that more valuable than starting a student chapter just because you can get involved with professionals right away and start networking and working with people who are already working in the field. But we do have two other active groups are iDiversity and Student Archivists at Maryland. Okay, so for admissions, um, right now we're doing applications for fall 2021. So you would start September, early September or the last week of August of 2021. And you can apply to either just the MLIS program or Hills. And if you're interested, so the MLIS program also does spring admissions. So you could start spring 2022, but for Hills, there is no spring admissions for Hills. It's only for fall. So if you want to apply for Hills, you can do it now or you'd have to do it for fall 2022. And that's only because the history program doesn't do spring admissions. Um, so when you apply to Hills, you have to be accepted to both the MLIS program and the history program. So 
that's sort of why you're doing you're doing both both programs requirements. Um, but if you were accepted to the MLIS program and you changed your mind later on and decided you actually wanted to do Hills, you could reapply to the Hills program. Um, you would sort of basically automatically be readmitted to the MLIS program, um, and then Hills would reass would assess your part of the application. And if they wanted to admit you, you would be accepted to Hills. But the deadline is January 20th, 2021. The Hills application in the system was showing December 15th or December 20th early on. So if you started an early Hills application, that deadline was not correct. The Hills deadline is January 20th. And one of the common questions I get is, do my letters of recommendation need to be submitted by the 20th? Um, and I would say yes, but there's time to, to have them submitted later. Just because when the application deadline closes the 20th, we start reviewing applications. So if none of your letters of recommendation have been received, then we'll review your application with none, which is not good. Um, but if you have like two of three submitted, then we'll still review it as complete. So that we'll give you a little bit of a little bit of time for your recommenders to submit their letter because we know it's not it's not your fault if they do it late or don't do it. Let me. Jill, do you want me to answer any questions in the chat right now, or just keep going? Do you need me to pause to answer any? Um. Um, we have a slide there's a question about placement percentages. So job placement stats. Oh, okay. Did we have a slide? Did I skip over that? No, it appears to have stack. It's disappeared. Yeah. Um I will unshare, find it, and then reshare at the end how I do that. Because I don't want to make up the stats. I know you're right, we do have stats. Um yeah, I'll do that at the end. Okay, so another common question, how will I pay? Do you provide scholarships or assistantships for incoming students? So we are able to provide two teaching assistantships to incoming students um, that cover, you, you have to, it's 20 hours a week and you TA for a, like one or two courses, um, but it includes tuition remission and a salary and health benefits. So any graduate assistantship or teaching assistantship on campus, if it's 20 hours a week, I think the salary is about 20,000. It's going to be, I think, a little more than that. Um, but it's a 20 hour a week gig and the salary is about 20,000 and it includes health insurance. So we are only able to offer two teaching assistantships. Um, but once you're accepted to the program, you can apply for any graduate assistantships across campus um, in any office across campus. So in 2019, 2020, about a third of our students were able to find graduate assistantships if they needed one. Um, about 50% of our students actually work full time and they're doing the MLIS on top of their jobs. Um, and the other 45% work part time and very few of our students don't, don't work at all. Um, but graduate assistantships you apply for like jobs, you go to ejobs.umd.edu and there's a section for graduate assistantships and you just apply there like jobs and interview and then that is how you do those. So when I was a student, I did not have an assistantship my first year, but my second year, I got one as an academic advisor in an undergraduate office for undecided majors, undeclared majors, it's called letters and sciences. Um, so not, not everyone gets stuff in the libraries. The libraries do have assistantships, but not, not one for every student. So. If you're able to find anything across campus, I think that's definitely, definitely worth it. And then we have some additional student resources. I think Jill sent the slides before with the reminder, but we can also resend the slides in all of these, all of these um, resources. Okay. Okay, let's do questions, but I'm going to stop sharing for a minute and try to find the placement information and reshare with you all. Uh, I was able to find it, Morgan. Oh, great. You want to yeah. share? Uh, yes. 
but I can also verbally say that uh, hiring information for 2018 graduates, so this would have been two years ago, 96% uh, of graduates were employed in June of 2019. So that's 95% uh, within a year of graduation. Um, can you share it just in case anyone is not able to yes. use audio or hear? And since we don't have captions, because yes. Zoom is has not caught up when it comes to accessibility. Are you able to see that? Yes, thank you. Beautiful. So there should be a big asterisk on this. I mean, the, these are people who responded to the survey, right? 95.8% of survey respondents. And the average starting salary was 60,000. I mean, it varies. If you're looking for high, high salaries, law libraries are the way to go. Government libraries. Otherwise, I think the starting salary is about, I think 50 to 60. 60,000 is about right for an MLIS grad. I have more. That's in our, it's in our career guides, guides, but I have, um, if you're interested in career placement, um, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics has information on librarians and archivists that I always find helpful. And then the ALA also has stuff, but sometimes it's a little outdated. But let me um, start answering questions. Let's see, did you answer, is there anything unanswered in the chat? Oh, I have one that someone sent privately. Um, can you share a bit more about p pursuing the PhD in InfoSci? Absolutely. Do you recommend having an MLIS before, before applying to that program, um, even if you have a master's degree from another discipline? So if you have a master's from another discipline, you could apply straight to the PhD program. Um, and I say that because our faculty, I think, have degrees from all over. I would say very few of our faculty actually have like an MLIS degree or a MIM degree or an HCIM degree. Most of them, a lot of them are coming from like education or journalism, public policy. Um, I mean, some of them have, a lot of them do have MLIS degrees who teach in our program, but you absolutely don't need to if you want to apply straight to the PhD program. If you have some a background in research or I would say the most important thing for applying to the PhD program is knowing what you want to research and knowing what you want to work on. Even if you're not sure and it's going to change later, having a clear idea of what you're interested in and what you want to do when you apply is great. And making sure that your interests that you indicate in your application matches one of the research areas that we list on our website in the PhD program. Because in order for you to be accepted, we have to have a faculty member who can support your research in that area. So if your research is out of anyone's area of, of expertise, it's hard to get accepted just because there's no one to support you basically in your PhD journey. Um, so I mean, having a PhD within the library and information science field is not, it's not necessary because the MLIS degree is technically the terminal degree in our field. Um, I mean, if you want to go on to be a faculty member or an instructor or teach in a program or in some academic library positions, they require two master's degrees, like an MLIS plus if you're going to be a subject specialist, um, something like if you're going to be a subject specialist in history, you have the MLIS plus history. Some people have PhDs anyways to sort of count for that requirement. Um, Jill, any other? Um, I would just say that the PhD program does uh, highly recommend that you apply with a master's degree. So it doesn't necessarily need to be in information science, um, but you are more likely to get accepted. Uh, it's not unheard of for students to come in with a bachelor's degree. It's just highly unlikely. I think if they have the BA and they get to the PhD program, it's because they have a very heavy they have a lot of experience in research. Like, they would need that to get in, I think. And a computational background. I, I think that applies more towards international students as well. Yeah. Um, 
Morgan, there's a question in the chat that got buried a little bit about our uh, admissions timeline. So when will students hear back about fall 2021? That's a great question. So we will, usually we try before spring break, which is mid-March, but I think our deadline's a little sooner this year. So January 20th, we'll start reviewing and give people maybe three weeks. Um, no, so I about, think about mid-March. We So here's the thing. We send our decisions to the graduate school first, um, and the graduate school does like a final approval. Um, so there's a couple reasons why things would get delayed at the grad school. If you have an undergrad GPA of, o, of under a 3.0, um, we have to write a letter, basically. It's called a letter of justification that says, because the grad school says you must have a 3.0 or higher in an undergrad degree to be accepted, but we can write a letter of justification that says this person does not need that, but they have an additional master's degree or they addressed it in their essay and said like they had um, like personal problems or issues during undergrad or they were doing a major that was really difficult and they had a very low GPA, um, something like that. So we write those letters often. Like we don't put a ton of stock into somebody who gets under like a lower 3.0 GPA. Um, that doesn't doesn't always matter to us. Um, so things can get held up at the grad school. If you're an international student and you need to submit TOEFL scores, things can get hung up there. But basically, we will send like mid-March your decision from our program saying whether you are accepted um, or not, and then you will hear from the grad school. But I think what we'll do this year is send an email to everyone who is accepted and let them know like you've been accepted to the program, we've sent it to the graduate school, you should hear from them. Um, they may be a little slow because for some reason they were slow this last round, um, but we'll let you know a little bit earlier and then you'll get your official notification from the grad school, if that makes sense. So I would say early to mid-March, you should hear from us. Uh, the other school implemented a new application system this last fall, and I think that that has taken up a lot of time um, in, in terms of troubleshooting as well as um, holding up their processes. So hopefully we'll be able to get things through faster this semester, but we're, we're kind of beholden to their procedures. Um, there's a question about the Hills program, can it be completed part-time? And I believe that's a yes. You have up to five years to complete both degrees. Yep, and the MLIS program too, you have up to five years. Lots of people do do it part-time, especially if you're working full-time. Taking one class, part-time can be basically one class a semester. You could take one in the fall and one in the spring. If you skip a semester for some reason, you need to just work with our academic advisor to send something to the grad school to let them know you're taking a semester off. Um, but one class a semester is fine, two a semester. Three per semester is technically full-time, not uh, including summer. So three in the spring, three in the fall. One thing to add about Hills is that while the MLIS can be completed completely online, uh, the history department traditionally has required students to do their coursework on campus. They just don't have an online program right now. Uh, right now the university is completely online. I don't know how that will impact their decisions in the future. They are actually doing classes in person. Their history faculty were insisting on being on campus for some classes, so yeah. You can do your MLIS purely if you're doing Hills. All of your MLIS courses could be online, but yeah, for history, you'll still need to be on campus. Um, there was one question about IPP and the specializations. I think specializations can be a little bit confusing. Um, they're not really formal programs of study, so everyone is doing an MLIS. Um, and then you choose your elective coursework based on your interests. So if you're interested in archives, you look at the archive specialization and say, okay, I want to take these seven electives, or I want to take these four archives classes, um, and then I want to take something from diversity and inclusion and something else, right? So the specializations are not rigid and they're not formal. They're just ways to help you plan your, your electives, basically, that you have. And the career guides the same thing, because the specialization guides students were saying like, yes, I want to learn about diversity and inclusion, but what careers does it open up to me? So the career guides are just another way for you basically to make the degree whatever you want it to be. Let's uh, see. 
there's a question about the field study and at what point in the program you do your field study. So it's intended to be the latter part of the degree program. So you have to take 18 credit hours before you should take the field study course. Um, and it's a 120 hour field study, yep. correct, Morgan? Okay. Yeah. You can do it a little bit early if you need to, or if you land like a really awesome field study, then you can just ask, talk to, send me and our director an email and let us know why you want to do it early. And that's usually fine with us, especially now we're being pretty flexible about it because students are trying to find remote field studies or it's really hard to get a public library volunteer position or internship right now just because public libraries are having so much trouble opening and then closing and finding enough work for full-time staff. Um, so students are, students are fine, have been really fine getting remote field studies right now. Um, but yeah, we can be flexible with that. So the tuition cost is a little bit, wait, did I, oh, I didn't skip them. The time commitment for the field study class, um, we actually moved to field study class online. We used to offer it online or in person, but realized you're already doing 120 hours of work and then having you come to campus to do a three hour class a week is a lot. So it's all online and it's all asynchronous. Um, it will be the normal workload of a course, but it, it's not as heavy as a course that's really like theory heavy. I mean, it's going to be practical stuff like you're making a portfolio or you're finding a job posting that you want to apply to and writing a cover letter and resume and your classmates are helping you with editing, that sort of stuff. And you're learning, I mean, you're reading articles from like, um, from business magazines and, and easier articles that help you understand like work culture and your organization that you're working in, things like that. Um, so the tuition cost, let me drop that into the chat. But tuition for online or on-campus classes, it's all done by in-state or out-of-state. And then fees are also standard across online and on-campus classes now. Yep, so, sorry, go ahead, Jill. There's no additional fees to be an online student. Um, right. So I just sent it in the chat. It's by credit hour. So it does matter if you're taking three, six, or nine credits per semester. The rate changes a little bit. Um, basically, the degree, the full degree is 36 credits, which is 12 classes. Each class is three credits. So 12 classes, 36 credits. So it depends on how you want to take, take your courses, but um, yeah. Let's see. Um, so do we do experiences with the university libraries? We do. There's something called the teaching fellowship. I'm missing words in that title. Emma? Yes. I can't remember what they are. The teaching fellowship. But basically, um, it's through university libraries, and it's for anyone who wants to become an academic librarian. Um, I think they have about eight to ten spots per year. Um, but basically, it's a paid opportunity where you do the information sessions in the university library and you work with the university librarians there to teach the information sessions that like undergrads go to um, when they learn how to use the libraries. Otherwise there are tons of GA ships and part-time opportunities within our libraries. So we have the university library, we have seven libraries or eight libraries. There's like a physics library, a math library. There's also special collections in university archives. So a ton of our students do part-time work there. So when I was a student, I had a part-time job there. Um, yeah, there's a preservation lab. There's, there's lots of places that you could, if you can't find a GA ship, you could probably work part-time. If you can't find a part-time job, you could volunteer or do an internship with our libraries. Um, will COVID deferrals impact the acceptance rate of upcoming admissions? So we don't have 
admissions caps at all. We basically say that our admissions are holistic. So we look at applications individual from from all of them, from anyone else's, and then accept or reject just based on your application. So we don't have a limit to how many people we can accept. Um, there have been more people deferring, but it hasn't accepted, it hasn't affected our acceptance, if that makes sense. Let's see, how many credits is considered full-time is three, sorry, three classes or nine credits per semester. So basically six classes a year. You could take one of those or two of those over the summer and split it up a little bit, but um, six classes a year. Ah, at what time of day do the courses take place is a great question. So in person, they either take place at two, from two to 4.45. So all of our classes um, meet only once a week for three hours once a week, right? And they don't meet on Fridays. It's either Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. And the times are either two to 4.45 or six to 8.45. So either 2 p.m. or 6 p.m. I would say a lot of them happen at six because people take into account that people are working full time. Um, now that we are online, we were online for the fall fully. In the spring, we have a couple people trying to run in-person classes, but um, they may end up just moving online anyways for now. But they are doing synchronous sessions. So like there's a class that I'm co-teaching in the spring and we're doing a synchronous session from 2 to 4.45 um, on Tuesdays. So most of our online classes are asynchronous, but people are getting more comfortable with having set um, class times online. And I think some people prefer it, some people don't, but let's see. So is it possible to take classes in multiple specializations? Yes, absolutely. You can take classes from whichever and whatever specializations you would like. Um, specializations are not formally noted on your transcript or anything, and they're not declared anymore, and they're not something that restricts you from, from doing other things, right? Um, so the museum certificate, yes, you can do that and other specializations. The school library certificate is harder because you have to take the school library curriculum, like you have to do the school library field study and you have to take the seven set school library courses um, just because it's tied to certification in Maryland. So you have to complete all of the courses to get the certification. If you wanted to do the museum certificate on top of that, you could, you would just have to take extra classes. Um, I mean, you can stay on past 36 credits, like past when you would have earned your MLIS degree to do something additional if you want to. If you have some people with GA ships end up doing that and taking more than they need. But yeah, for school libraries, you would need to take additional classes if you wanted to take, do something like the museum certificate. The GRE is not re required for the MLIS degree. Um, it is required for Hills usually, but not this year. The Hills program is waiving that requirement this year because of COVID. So if anyone is on the fence about Hills, I would say maybe just apply because there's no GRE requirement if you haven't taken the GRE. Um, and if you get in and then you don't want to do it later on, we can change you from the Hills designation to just MLIS and you're fine. And if you apply to Hills and you do not get accepted to history, but you get accepted to MLIS, then we will offer you admissions just to MLIS. Same with history. If you get, if you apply to history and you do not get accepted to MLIS, but you're accepted to history, they will offer you a place just as a history master's student. If that makes sense. Um, there was another question about how many candidates are you accepting for fall 2021? So we do not have a cap. So we will accept. Um, it depends on how many people apply. And then there's no limit to how many, how many we can accept. Um, there are courses in the summer as well. We offer all of our core courses in the summer and then a handful of electives. We also offer winter courses, but the winter term is only three weeks. Um, but we have a genealogy course every winter, and we now have a course on 
managing information institutions during crises, which is a new one. And we also offer one credit courses in the winter and summer. So there are some skills courses, like you could do a one credit on JavaScript, or I think there's CSS and HTML. Um, and then in the in this summer, we're offering new courses on diversity in children's literature, and then writing and evaluating book reviews. So there are also chances to do three one credit courses in the winter or in the summer. Let's see. There's a question about certificate programs, but I will come back to that one. Are there any study abroad opportunities? There used to be, <laughs> there are not right now. Um, we had one planned to Russia. Somebody was gonna do one to Russia that they had done before to St. Petersburg, and they were gonna do it again this summer, um, but it got canceled. So as soon as it is safe to travel again, we have two that usually run right now. Um, there was one to Japan in March to learn about disaster preparedness, I think, and information um, during spring break. It was a week study abroad. And then the trip to St. Petersburg, Russia will be a two week trip in the summer. So as soon as we're able to travel again, we will do those. We used to have one, um, we used to have several that I hope people will reboot again. One was like cathedrals and archives and museums of England. And I really hope someone does that again. Um, Jill, you and I should do that again. Um, there was another one in Scotland where they followed the, it was called Follow the Fringe and they went to the Fringe Festival and they helped um, basically, yeah, it was, it was awesome basically like capture information and archive the French festival. It was so cool. I will try to get those back. Morgan, we should do that. Tie it into the history of archives and libraries course that should happen. <laughs> Let's do it, yeah. I love, I love study abroad classes, so I would love to do it. Um, the next question, what is DC residency considered? It is unfortunately out of state, yeah. It is out of state. And we do get questions about if you're in Virginia. There used to not be any LIS programs in Virginia. And if Virginia residents could have in-state Maryland tuition, um, that is not something that we do. And I think now Old Dominion has an MLIS program. I don't know if it's accredited yet. I think they're being, they're going through ALA accreditation right now. So do you take into consideration a previous master's degree for the application, yeah, absolutely. Whatever you, any of your education, your work, your volunteer background, we take all of it into, into consideration. If you have an undergrad GPA that's under 3.0, but then you have a master's degree that you've successfully completed, um, usually that's enough for us to write a letter of justification for why you should be accepted despite having under 3.0. If accepted for fall 2021, can that be deferred if needed? Absolutely. I think you can defer once and you can defer up to a year out. So if you're accepted for fall 2021, you could defer to the spring or you could defer to fall 2022. And there's no cost to accept your enrollment. There's no cost to defer or anything. Um, a lot of people defer and then decide later. Okay, I did have one question about certificate programs. We did have a certificate in school libraries program before, but it is not active right now. It needs to be re-evaluated and then recreated basically. So we only have one certificate program, which is the DCIP or Digital Curation for Information Professionals certificate, but that is not for credit and it's not really tied to the MLIS program at all. So if you apply to the DCIP program, um, you don't have like a university ID and you don't apply through the, the university system. Um, you do take classes in Elms Canvas, which is our online course platform. And you take courses with Richard Marciano, who's one of our tenure faculty, and then Mark Conrad, who worked at NARA for the National Archives for, I wanna say like 40 years and is retired now and is also teaching those courses. So you're taking the classes with our faculty and in our systems, but you are not considered a degree seeking or non-degree seeking student. You pay for the courses, take them, and then you get your, your certificate. And if you do that certificate, it can't be applied to the MLIS program later or anything, if that makes sense. Did I miss any or are there any other questions?
My favorite part of the program when I was there, um, I had lots of favorite parts. I really liked working for the university archives. That was so cool because the university archives has like a reading room and then traditional archive stacks and then a rare books and library section. So there were so many cool rare books that I loved. Um, yeah, that was just a really fun experience. Anytime you work for special collections, it's so cool to see what they have. And I like did some exhibit stuff. So for Halloween, we got like a bunch of Edgar Allan Poe books that we had and some with some really cool illustrations and things like that. Um, I also did an unpaid internship that wasn't really a field study, but it could have been um, at the Freer and Sackler Gallery in DC, which is my favorite museum. It's in the Museum of East Asian Art. Um, so there's an archive there that is tiny. There's like one archivist and an assistant archivist. So I did an internship for the summer. It was like six weeks and I went down once a week basically for the day and I got to process one of their collections. Um, for this woman, her name was Elizabeth Moynihan and she, her husband was a diplomat in Iran in the 1970s and while they were there she basically um, like did archaeology on her like on the side and went and found like old ancient gardens and stuff. It was so cool. So I processed her collection and I got my Smithsonian badge and worked for the Smithsonian for a summer. So that was really cool. I think in DC you have so many awesome opportunities to work and then get hired later on. A lot of our grads go on to work in Library of Congress and the National Archives is in both DC and College Park. The National Archives, it's called Archives 2, is like right down the road from our campus. So I actually had a part-time job there for only a few weeks before I got a um, graduate assistantship. But that was also a cool one. Yeah, lots of lots of good opportunities in DC. So rare book and special collections librarianship, we only have, so to, to put that together, you would definitely do history of the book and you would definitely do our special collections class. Um, and I would say some archives classes like processing um, an arrangement and description and, or probably metadata if you are going to be cataloging books anyways. Um, but otherwise you, you could probably piece together we don't have a formal specialization in rare books. Special collections, you could definitely do. And it depends on what you wanna do in special collections. So within special collections, there's instruction and outreach. So if you wanted to do that, you would take, I would say the user instruction course and our outreach course and things like that, right? If you wanted to do digital curation, cause archives and special collections now have digital curation centers. Um, we do have a ton of digital cur curation classes. Um, yeah, there's a way to piece it together based on what your interests are. But special collections, I think, are very broad. I don't know. There are many different roles within special collections. So like you could be doing metadata or you could be doing cataloging. If you wanted to do preservation or appraisal or something, that is harder because most preservationists have a background in chemistry or things like that. Am I missing anything there, Jill? Um, not as far as I know. I'm not getting acquainted with our courses, but I think um, preservation, and, and I have friends that have backgrounds in preservation. Um, I think for certain things, you don't necessarily need the chemistry background, but for restoration, you do. Um, yeah. And it really depends upon how you want to interact with the artifacts. Um, but there is a question here about what makes this program stand out. And I'm going to let you take the lead on that. And I'm going to piggyback off of it because I did come from a different program. Yeah, I would like to hear your perspective because I came from this program. So it's hard for me to say. I would say um, our faculty, our full-time faculty, and then our adjunct faculty. We have a lot of adjunct faculty who are teaching for us because we choose them because they're the best ones to teach certain classes. Like the preservation class that we teach, we choose Beatrice Hasbo semester after semester because she's the head of preservation 
at Library of Congress and she has connections and she has experience and she can show students um, things that really our faculty who aren't working in the field right now don't have access to. So really for the hands-on skills classes like preservation um, and a lot of the archives classes and academic libraries and public libraries, we choose people from the field like public librarians and academic librarians who can like are great teachers but also have the experience to teach you real world things that are happening during their day, right? During their day jobs. Um, and then I think just opportunities in DC to work for the Smithsonian or Library of Congress um, or Pratt in Baltimore. There are so many opportunities in the area that we try to connect you with um, that just help you build networks and make connections before, before you find jobs. The field study too. If you go on to a different program that doesn't require a field study, I would say do an internship somewhere, especially if you're able to take an unpaid internship at the institution of your dreams, because it's gonna help you get a letter of recommendation from internally and then help set you up for jobs. It's really the best way to get into hard, into hard positions, I think. Jill, what were you gonna say? I, I honestly, direction that I was going to go in as well. I was very fortunate to be able to obtain my degree from my employer. So I worked for Syracuse University for five years while I obtained my MLIS. And it was a great program and I had wonderful faculty that I worked with. But I think that the opportunities that UMD has are unparalleled, um, basically because of the longstanding relationships with federal organizations and the proximity to DC. There are a lot of in-person opportunities and virtual opportunities that students across the country aren't necessarily going to have. Um, and as someone who was on the job market recently, uh, the students that are coming through this program do have a little bit of an advantage in those federal positions as well as the regional positions. I'm based in Baltimore. Um, so there is a big, big library community here, both in the city as well as Baltimore County. Um, if you're interested in public libraries, Prince George's County where uh, UMD is also has a thriving library community as well. I think we're also one of the, well, a lot of programs are going online and I think more programs will go online after this, but I think we will make a, have a, we will be committed to still offering classes in person because there are just so many people who want to take classes in person. Um, so we keep making that work for people who want to do that. But I mean, then we try to rotate our online classes. So if you want to take preservation or archives online, it's still available to you. Any other questions? I am going to put the yeah, the field study versus thesis route. So the field study is just, um, it's an internship, right? It's 120 hours at any information institution under the supervision of an information professional, right? So if you're at a library, we don't want, really want students to do like an archiving project for a local organization that has no one to supervise you because the point of the project is not just to get experience, it's to work with somebody in the field who has experience and has completed like an MLIS or, or a similar degree. Um, so the point of the field study is to get you hands-on experience and then to give you experience in an organization, basically with a mentor who's going to help you understand how their organization works, right? Um, so that's just one semester, it's one class, and you do 120 hours of your internship and then take the class on top of that. Um, it's sort of like a career prep class as well. Um, the thesis route, if you do the thesis, I think you need to take additional classes. You need to take like six credits instead of just three. Um, and then you need to submit, you need to choose a research area and you will choose a faculty member to work with to sort of help advise you through that. Um, and then a thesis committee. So when you submit your thesis, there will be people, the faculty within the MIS program who approve your thesis. Um, and it just depends on, on what you wanna do, I think. A lot of students who do the thesis wanna go on to a PhD, but I would say people who wanna work in academic libraries, a thesis may be a good option for you because a lot of academic librarians are also faculty members and you have a research 
responsibility as a faculty member and you're supposed to publish as an academic librarian. So if you're interested in working for a university library as an academic librarian, um, I think doing the thesis may be a good option. If you're not interested in the thesis, you could at, at least take a research methods course um, just to help you because you will probably do, be doing research down the line. How do online courses work? Um, it depends on the instructor, how they want to teach it. Some people teach synchronously, which is with set times to meet each week, but that is, it's more common now because of COVID, since all of our in-person classes moved online, it was less common before. Most of our online classes were asynchronous. So each week you would have um, like a lecture video and then readings and then activities or discussions within the online course space. And then sometimes there were optional meetings or office hours you could meet with, but usually there was no fixed like lecture time, if that makes sense. Online courses don't work for everyone. I mean, it takes a different type of motivation to do online courses because you're really, it's up to you to keep up, keep up with the work and engage. And the more you engage, the more you get out of it, really. Any other questions? I wonder if I could show, if we have time, you could show an Elms space really quick. Let's see. Okay, if there are no other questions, I can show you guys an Elm space really quick. I will show you, you know, a couple minutes. I'll show you the one that we have for our students, which is, wait, let me see. Okay. So we use, it's called Elm's Canvas for our online courses. So this is the page that I've made for our MLIS students. Um, so we have a to-do list on the side, which if you had activities, they would be listed there. And then we have modules to complete and announcements, things like that. So within your online course, you would probably have modules on the side. We don't have, the modules are not open. But I mean, you do discussions. So we have discussions open for our students. Um, you engage in discussion boards. You, let's see, page-wise. Usually each week you'll go through like a module and you'll have, you will have something like a lecture here or readings here. This is our academic advisor, Nicole. And then like an assignment or something. And then a discussion. Usually there's a lot of discussion, discussion-based work. Um, yeah, but there's lecture recordings. There are a lot of different features that it depends on the on the instructor what what features they use, but mostly it's lectures, readings, discussions, and then group work that you all would organize on the side. Any other questions before we end? Or Jill, anything I miss? No, I think you got it. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. I can probably send a, um, there used to be like a free tutorial on Elms and it just gives you a, an overview of it. Let me see if I can find that. So the application fee is $75 and there are ways to waive it. Um, it's all through the grad school. Let me find it really quick.
But there are certain ways to waive the fee. So the first link I sent is just um, something that's open for anyone to take. It's a online student success module if you're interested. Um, for our program or for any program you'll apply to, um, it's going to show you like Elms Canvas, the, the space that we use, but it also just gives you tips on succeeding as an online student. Um, and then the second link is information on fee waivers. So pre-matriculating course route, um, I think that means before being accepted to the program, yes? Yeah, I would have a degree seeking option. Yeah, so you could, um, you can apply to the grad school as a non-degree seeking student and then take courses that way. And then if you are accepted to the program, um, you can transfer up to nine credits, which is three classes um, to the program. So you would apply as non-degree seeking and then, okay, Jill's got the link, thank you. Um, I think it would be possible for the spring semester because it doesn't start until January 24th or 25th. Um, so if you applied and were accepted to the grad school, I don't think it takes that long. So I think it is an option. But if you're accepted as non-degree seeking and you want to take a class, You'll need to contact the instructor for permission to take the class, and then there's a form on our website to fill out. And then you would be able to register for it the first day of classes to take it. Um, but if you're accepted as a non-degree seeking student and you see a class that you want to take, um, send us an email. You can send it to the program email, and then we can forward you to our academic advisor, and she can help you out. There are caps to classes. Most classes are capped at 30 students, but it depends on, usually if, if there's 30 and then a couple, a couple court students on the wait list, the faculty will let them in. Is there a course list for each semester? Yeah, it's on testudo.umd.edu. Our mascot's name is testudo, so that's where all of our student stuff is. So if you go to testudo.umd.edu and click schedule of classes, um, it's there. And all of our classes are either LBSC or INST and INFM. But um, you, as a student, you could take any of the classes in LBSC, INST or INFM, but um, students sometimes take I INFM, but it's not as common. So what that means is yeah. be eligible to take it offered through an high school program since we don't have technical we're able to allow you that option. Yeah, we don't have departments. So we have the human computer interaction masters, the masters of information management and our library science um, master's program. So you can take courses in either of those master's programs and they count for your MLIS degree. Which is great if you're, especially if you're interested in records management or working for the government or anything about intelligence or data analytics, things like that. You can take a lot of, a variety of more technical courses to sort of pad your MLIS degree. Great. It is 11, so should we end? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Um, I put the program email in, but my email, I'll send it. That is my email. If you want to send me an email, we, okay, we are closed. The university is closed yeah. next week, starting the 23rd until January 4th. So we might be slow to respond, but otherwise send us an email. I would actually recommend emailing MLIS program at umd.edu just because you'll get the out of office message with all of the helpful information that I forget to put in emails. So send an email to that first and then Jill or I will check it and, and respond to you there. Great. Thanks everyone. Yes, thanks for coming. Bye.